Well, thank you. Um, and this is certainly one of the more fun panels to have because really this is, this is the one where we, we wrap things up a bit. We, we take what we've heard over the last couple of days and, and come to some conclusions. And, and you know, what, what better way of doing this than with uh, uh, Barbara Colm, uh, Ambassador Rekha Sermakini and uh, John O'Sullivan, who are, are all intellectual forces to be reckoned with in the conservative movement. Uh, so I think let, let's start with, with a sort of easy question, which is what would you take as the highlight for you of this conference? Perhaps we'll start with Barbara. that uh, we agreed that we should collaborate finally and that uh, we had a, un a unification of the pro-market, li more libertarian, classical libertarian forces and uh, so-called neocons and conservatives which, you know, have always been divided in Europe, at least on the think tank level and also on the academic level. So I think this is a... Excellent outcome. Congrats to New Direction to bring that together. Rika? Thank you. So I think the most important impression that um, really struck me as I got here and throughout these uh, panels and discussions and various viewpoints and opposing you know, perspectives uh, that we went through, uh, which was really stimulating, was this atmosphere of collegiality. I felt that this is really something that can bind us together. So it's something that can make um, us understand this sort of the, um, the uh, message of our times, that we need to cooperate. We need to work together and we need to focus on what is common and uh, that beyond that understanding, we have the level of collegiality which sticks it together. So I, I came very optimistic. John? Um, it's very uh, hard to single out any one particular thing. I would say <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I enjoyed very much the wokeness uh, panel, and uh, and I think it's very important too because it's only now that really people in all of the organisations represented here are beginning to focus on the fact that it is in a sense the central challenge which we we have to meet. Um, but the fact is there have been strong and effective speeches across the board, and I agree with Reka that um, it's what is demonstrated here is the collegiality and the ability to compromise and debate and discuss uh, on, on what is, you know, undoubtedly the far left will describe as the far right. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and this is important because the uh, evoters and, and, um, and even the and even columnists and special political um, commentators um, see the ability to debate um, in civil ways as an important test of suitability for office. And I think that's been demonstrated again and again. So the common theme in, in all of your answers is of course this idea of fusionism, this idea that we are, are bringing back a conservative or at least a center-right movement that can stretch from a libertarian side all the way up to a sort of national conservative side. So the, the, the real question is what are those broad themes that are, are connecting us? What, what is it that we've seen as a common thread throughout the conference? Perhaps we'll start with John on this one. Well, I think the common theme is that all of the groups have as their enemy the radical progressive state. Um, I remember having a conversation at a Montpenra meeting back about 30 years ago with Murray Rothbard. And Murray and I really didn't agree in anything except Broadway musicals, and on that we, we saw eye to eye. But in, in the course of the conversation, and the Mont Pelerins, it was a Mont Pelerin conference, uh, I said to Murray, you know, Murray, um, you and I are going to be on opposite sides of the barricades in the final analysis. And he said, yes, we are, John, that's true. But the final analysis is, is historically so far away, I don't think it need disturb our friendship. <laughs> Rekha? And it's a tough question because I felt that through our dis uh, throughout these uh, discussions in, in these two days, there were several issues that emerged really as kind of focal points of cooperation. And uh, so I wouldn't be able to say one, although there are highlights, and I agree with John absolutely about his, uh, with his identification of this issue. But I would say I could see at least you know, three, four other big issues that around which we can 
very easily, very genuinely, very strongly cooperate. And I think those issues will be the challenge for, uh, will be helping us to get forward, but will be the challenge for all of us to really continue to keep them on the, on the forefront and, and, work, uh, and work around them. Nachi so, Babru. If you have an additional question. I had a, a follow-up, which is, I, I'm going to push you to, to name those areas that you think are, are the focal point for us. Okay, so one, I agree, um, this identification of um, the main challenger and the main sort of value challenge uh, to our, in the 21st century, to our societies. Uh, the second, I think, is the understanding, proper understanding of conservatism and the discussion on conservative values, which was really clearly clar clarifying the, uh, the content of the, uh, of, of the notion, which unifies us uh, fundamentally. Um, a third one probably is the um, is a strong understanding of the external challenges that we are uh, we're facing that threaten to take away the uh, the freedoms and the uh, the values that we have uh, um, we we cherish that we have. Um, so far, I think I had one more, but I will it will come back. <laughs> so, Barbara. Uh, well, I had divided this from a. This conference clearly was philosophical um, and political, or had this angle at least. So we need the underpinning, that uh, the academic underpinning that was presented by all the uh, talks, and especially at the last, uh, second last panel with John Hannes and and our other friends, who really brought in the broad spectrum, and so that there is an understanding that the hand works, the tools that the think tanks and institutions need to work on, that they have their solid basis um, in order to defend our values, that this is there. So we worked, we drilled it down from the broader spectrum, and now we need to go to the realities that we in each and every country face. And this is what some think tanks do focus on already, whether it's economic issues, whether when we discuss example, for example, inflation now, what triggers inflation. So this is the next level of understanding or how are political parties, you know, being formed in another, or how do they make their opinions, et cetera, et cetera. So this are, these are topics that you can drill down to specific ones, but we need the general understanding. Uh, and this was clearly uh, provided at this conference, and now we can go into depth and uh, have specialists on each and every topic. And I think this would be the next, the next level to take this conference to. So we're, what, what effectively we're seeing emerge is almost a sort of Buckley style of fusionism. Because uh, it, it, Buckley, when he was working for National Review and setting out the sort of the groundwork for the modern conservative movement, it was a matter of giving people the competencies that they know best. So the sort of neocon movement was put in charge of the national security policy, the libertarian movement in charge of the economic policy, and the sort of Christian right in charge of social and family policy. So are we seeing that kind of return of fusionism? I'll, I'll throw that open to any of you. Uh, okay, well, because I worked on National Review, though not in the period that you're talking about. And, um, and in my view, the, uh, and practically everyone in National Review was an intellectual of one kind or another, and some very distinguished ones. I would say James Burnham, um, whom Bill himself thought was the most important of, uh, intellectual influence on him and the magazine. Wilmore Kendall, this wayward but brilliant ma pro-majoritarian uh, theorist. Um, uh, Russell Kirk, of course, who felt himself uh, a bit out of the, the mainstream of the magazine, but remained an important voice on it um, for most of the time. And, and then, of course, the most uh, significant, in a way, the man who wrote Witness, um, and whose name has just gone out of my head. Uh, uh, Whitaker Chambers, thank you. And Whitaker Chambers, of course, was a huge spiritual influence on um, the, the magazine uh, and on Bill personally. Now, naturally, people like that were not in the main thinking and talking about running election campaigns. Um, but they did provide, and so th therefore, the arguments they had tended to concentrate 
uh, on, on the divisions and incompatibilities between different points of view, which in my view, electorally, were not that significant. That we now see that at the moment in the argument between, on the one hand, um, the bulk of conservatives in America, that is, who are strong supporters of John Locke and trace American liberties back to his influence, and Yoram Hazani, who locates the liberties of the English, thus the Americans, in, long, in the historical traditions and contributions of people like John Selden and, um, now I've forgotten his name too, uh, Blackstone. Now, um, uh, th that is an extremely important debate about where are liberties derived from. But from the standpoint of a practical politician, why would he worry other than to say, well, they derive from both, so let's move on. Uh, and, and, but there were important influences from National Review on uh, political debate. I will, sign, I will mention just, uh, maybe, maybe just one actually. And that was the influence of James Burnham. Because what Burnham, if you go back and look at the magazine, for the first five to 10 years of its life, it was a, 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 a very angry, critical, um, uh, it, it, it developed a critical hostility, of quite powerful on Bill's part personally, to I, the Eisenhower regime, uh, which he thought of as a kind of smothering liberal I influence. Um, and consequently was actually prepared, as, as, as later his, um, the publisher, Bill Rusher, actually advocated setting, uh, ignoring the Republicans and trying to found a, a third party. But Burnham essentially persuaded Bill, and therefore the magazine, to promote and advance and publicize the most viable the most rightward viable of the viable candidates. And that's what the magazine subsequently did. And you have to say, it paid off. Because, yes, we went through Nixon, whom I think is a better president than most other people, I have high regard for him. But we ended up with the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Now, I don't say we were the only reason Reagan got elected, but we were a significant reason. And that, and that is due, I think, to the advice that Bill accepted from, from uh, Burnham. And Burnham essentially was a tough, hard-headed uh, calculator of interest. And um, it, he really did not want to be dis obstructed uh, by men he admired, like Russell, who wanted to, in a sense, move into other areas which could only create political problems for the party and for the magazine. So, I mean, I think in the end, Burnhamite um, calculation um, became, in the second half of the magazine's life, or the, or the second of its five lives, um, the, uh, the, the advocate of, of, um, of a, not a fusionism, but a careful balance uh, aimed not only at keeping the magazine and the party together, but also at, at garnering as large a quantity of voters uh, as you could. And so, Barbara, perhaps you would perhaps like to pick up on that idea of keeping a careful balance in the movement. Well, that, that is exactly the three dimensions that you were talking about um, are truly important uh, to... Um use the division of labor as a classic libertarian, that we know this works best, and not to reinvent the wheel, that we get to know how our networks and how our partners tick, and that I don't have to write the next study on, say, healthcare, whatever, COVID things, but I can call my friends in, say, Spain or in Croatia and say, can you please send that to us and we can work on our country problems on this study and divide labor in order to, uh, to use those resources that we have that are scarce, literally. And the last panel was discussing finances as well, um, that we can make the best out of that. So this is a step that we, or a, um, a level that we all need to agree on and that we have to uh, collaborate and divide our labor. And then here you have, in addition to that, um, you have the think tanks as, and also the academia as those who provide those tools that are ready to go for our politicians to defend those values 
uh, outside in the political arena. And after all, the collaboration is center to center right. And it's not center and then we stop and then we, the next group is center right and then the next group is ultra right. And no, the enemies are too big and uh, so we can discuss that when we have con when we have conquered everything center to center uh, <laughs> left a little bit, but the center right is all ours. Then we can discuss that when we divide. Then when we when we um, change the path again and and uh, let's um, drift apart. But I think right now we must not do that. So, Reka, perhaps you can add some substance to this idea of. Uh, creating cohesion, but also providing tools necessary to keep the movement moving. Thank you so much. And I, I am thrilled, you know, by this meeting that we uh, have had, and which is not the first in a row. So we, it's a continuum, really, of, uh, of keeping this um, thought together and strengthening it. I very much um, believe that the uh, everything agreeing everything with what John and Barbara said of how important this is to know of each other that exactly this is the challenge that we uh, see in front of us and that we can respond to by saying that yes although we genetically are not political genetically are not uh, about to create unified organizations or unified uh, yeah bodies absolutely and it's not but what we could see is it's not necessary because the way we can cooperate is much stronger because we can focus on these issues and on the basis of this uh, issues we can uh, cooperate on issues and for this I think there are two or three preconditions one is certainly to have these four where we meet and to continue to have regular meeting points where we know of each other's uh, latest results so that we can reach out and we can incorporate them into. And we know of each other's strengths uh, and potentials. And with uh, all due modesty, if I may say, uh, the offer or the potential, for instance, that we can bring to the to the common table as an in international republican institute is that we are there in over 100 countries. We have, just as we speak, over several hundred projects running in, their, in all of these over 100 countries. So no matter where you would like to go or where you would like to launch a new project or where you are and you, are, you need some kind of an extra network or an extra idea or a potential to work together, um, use us as a, a, an anchor point or as a starting point where you can start investigating the possibilities. We do have the logistics on the ground. Our focus is very, very practical. So what you mean by substance is, yes, it's very muscle, muscle work. We're there on the field. What we do there is to network, understand the reality, network with the people, find the people who are on board with our values, identify and work with them, develop programs. And that is an offer to everybody, uh, to all of us. So as what we have seen in many occasions that a lot of our friends already here have started to to use that network that we have, I think it's a fantastic way to cooperate in a very substantive, very concrete way to uh, focus on particular countries, to particular networks, on issues, and start developing common projects together because we have the resources available. Can I add a little uh, thing? Because uh, there is a saying when you have five libertarians in a room, you have a hundred opinions and a hundred different ways they go. and. Uh, what I have seen in Europe so far in the past years because of all the pressure that has come to our movement that uh, at least we don't have 100 ideas now, we only have 50 ideas and we find a way how to at least uh, take the neck, uh, march uh, the way along. And I think this is a big advantage, uh, an advancement, but we are not there where we are supposed to be. And this is where we can, what we can learn from the United States, that they have done that in a much better way uh, and uh, not out-competed each other, but used the competition in order, to, uh, in order to rise the level and the quality of the products, but not in the collaboration. And just gives, there is enough space for each and every group and think tank you know, and organization there because, as I said, the field is so big and the enemies are much better equipped, unfortunately.
It's, it's very much a case of uh, us on the center right practicing what we preach. We, have the, we always talk about a marketplace of ideas, but I think what Barbara Combe is describing here is a free market of ideas, and that effectively we need to take this sort of Adam Smith approach to the division of labor as a movement. Uh, and you know, it, There's something important about this idea of networking. I think a lot of you yesterday took part in the uh, International Coalition lunch. It was an introduction to just one of many fora that exist for us to be able to share ideas, and to ask for help and to spread ideas and you know one of the things about being here in person is that you are net, you, you know you're networking with each other without having to be behind a screen and, and that's something that has become so important after the last two years but there's there's something further to that which is that you know whilst you're here I don't think anyone should be leaving this place without you know at least 25 business cards and, and follow-up emails or or at least 50 new Twitter followers of people that they can share their content with so they can stay in touch but perhaps we can talk a bit more about how we can expand our network where, where should we be going next what should we be doing to bring more people in I, I throw that open to any of you Well, I think, first of all, we should recognize gratefully the degree to which our market has expanded. And thinking about the fact that in both Britain and America, but of continental Europe as well, uh, the number of magazines and websites, but mag magazines t too, ha um, of a conservative um, religious or classical liberal bent has expanded enormously in recent years. <laughs> Magazines like The Critic in London, for example, clearly takes a point of view um, which is as close to the people in this room as, as anything else, and that comes on top of The Spectator, um, the Salisbury Review, and um, other magazines which, are, which have emerged in well, standpoint in recent years. That's even more dramatic in the United States. When I went to National Review, it was fundamentally one of two conservative magazines. This was in 1988. The other was the uh, magazine that became the American Spectator, um, Bob Terrell's The Alternative. But now um, you have uh, a great mushroom uh, rooming of, mag of, of conservative magazines, um, like, for example, um, Roger Kimball's uh, The New um, uh, Criterion. <laughs> and uh, the Clermont Review of Books, which does for the right what the um, a New York Review of Books has done for the left. Uh, of course, you've got uh, represented here the editor, uh, uh, editor of the European Conservative, which began as um, uh, the brainchild of uh, one man, uh, Mario Fantini, but has since now, in a sense, accumulated more support and um, uh, and, and it is now, I think, a very important magazine, a new kind of voice and an important one on, on the right. In, on, and that, of course, you all know before that, there were uh, institutions from the Institute of Economic Affairs in London to, uh, to um, well, I'm trying to think of, well, I suppose, uh, uh, the, the, the Salisbury Group, for example, or the Conservative Philosophy Group. Th this is... There's no doubt that the intellectual universe of the right, broadly defined, is expanding dramatically. And it, I think influence on the community as a whole, intellectual, will follow by degrees, but it is already very substantial. I also would, should mention books. I mean, for example, um, the, the, the development of the, um, the, that Anna talked about, uh, of uh, national conservatism, that emerges from um, uh, Rioram Hazani's book um, uh, on national conservatism, um, which has had a large impact on the American right, and I think uh, outside America in Central Europe too. Um, Yoram has now gone on to, um, not to spark, but to join an already lively debate on the meaning and nature of conservatism. And that the, the debates and arguments, in, particularly in America, on his new book are very important. He's attracted, and I would say, respectful critics, um, like Daniel uh, Mahoney, um, it, who is himself has a book on humanitarianism out about a year ago, um, which, uh, was, uh, which was very critical of humanitarianism from a Christian standpoint. Of course, 
um, the president of this organization, um, Richard Legutko, um, has had more than one book in, uh, recently, but the, the one which, of course, has made a big impact across the Atlantic, and I think in, in Europe too, but interestingly across the Atlantic in a big way, um, is, has, has altered um, debate uh, on democracy very considerably there as well. I mean, they, we now look at the period from 1989 to the present in a very different way as a result of reading about the transformation of, of what had been a, a relatively free interpretation of de democracy into something much more constricting. And um, so uh, you know, they, they, there isn't, in my view, I'm, I'm open to correction here, there's not, in my view, anything like the same vitality combined with realism in the debates of the left, and, and they're occurring here. What will that do? I'm not entirely sure, uh, because after all, I didn't predict, well, actually, I did predict, but nobody listened to me, the, um, uh, the, the, what would happen in, um, uh, with the woke revolution back in 1988. I was writing about those things then, and, uh, and so on, but the fact is, um, People, the, the ideas that spread and are discussed but are ignored, they normally have a, a, delayed, um, a, a delayed impact on public opinion, a bit like depth charges. You know, the depth charge goes out, there's a long pause, and then the ship sinks. So I think what we need to do is re realize that we're, at the moment, we're, we're pushing on an open door, but one in which a lot of shoulders on the other side are trying to close, because they don't want to hear these ideas expressed openly and clearly and honestly. And, and, and what's just happened to Do Toby Young and his Free Speech Institute, which has just been cancelled by, um, uh, it's not Twitter, um, PayPal, and by the way, they apparently kept his money as well, um, which I think opens them to really interesting uh, civil charges. But still, we, they, they, the reason why they're trying to shut us up, because we're saying interesting things, and true things, and powerful things. So I really think we're, uh, we're on a roll. Um, the question is, will the world notice that role or not? I'll bring Barbara in on that. Yeah. Um if we check the boxes, say in Western Europe after the founding of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, and here and in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, I think we have come a long way. Uh, if you check the boxes, number of think tanks increased, number of academics uh, collaborating and working internationally on our topics have increased. Uh, the number of journalists, unfortunately, has decreased. Uh, the number of public opinion leaders has decreased uh, that defend our true values. So I think the next step that we should take is either, and this is a big wish, uh, we should have a center, center right, conservative, libertarian TV, Europe wide, no, professional, you know, really professional, not just like what everybody of us tries to do the YouTube things that are excellent content wise, but it's less, we need something professional. And then, what we all need to work on. Get the entrepreneurs and the business people, the private sector involved in our debates. You know, when we go around and raise money and work with those people, we tell them all the time, hey, we make sure that you, that you are not taxed to death. We make sure that our politicians uh, vote against this overregulation or against this and that. And then, you know, they all say, Sorry, I just don't have the time. I need to run my enterprise. I need to run my business. Okay, I understand this could be the division of labor, but we want them involved in our debates because they should also show face and stand to their opinions and stand to their values. I mean, after all, entrepreneurial values uh, that we have discussed over the past two days are there to be defended, but not only by us, but also by those who, who need this uh, strong backhold. And I think this would be a big wish to, to have in the next couple of years, have a bunch of strong 
uh, entrepreneurs sitting in this room, standing up and saying, hey guys, you are doing great work, thanks for that. We collaborate on various other issues. And I think by that we get the stone rolling. The left has unfortunately done that, and with the well-meaning people, they, uh, you know, they, they fall into their trap just because it's socially nice to be good. Um, we, are, we are better. <laughs> we do good instead of the others. I didn't think this is something that we need to transform. It's, a, it's especially an issue as we watch more and more brands around the world becoming uh, so-called socially conscious. I mean, n none of us really wants to know what the ice cream company Ben & Jerry's thinks about the Israel-Palestine problem, but they make sure to tell us anyway. But, Rekha, perhaps you... Yeah, thank you. I think we should go in two directions at the same, uh, parallelly, because this is a moment when we are really taking stock of this incredible growth of insight, of, um, of ideas, of very strategic thinking about our long-term values, which really are appealing, I think, to a large part. Um, to the younger generation as well. So I think in one, one direction to follow is to bring these um, deep thoughts uh, that are embodied in the, uh, in the writings that John enumerated uh, towards the youth and try to make sure that they understand, that they know about it, and then they can start thinking about it, they can debate this. And the other, and we have a number of training events and, and, and gatherings where we are there and we can sense that there is an interest and there is a, a place for that. And at the same time, parallel to this, I would absolutely side with uh, what Barbara was just saying. I think we have a fantastic group of potential supporters, sponsors, and people who are of this uh, value basis and who are not aware probably of all the um, this intellectual richness and intellectual depth that we have um, witnessed just in these two days, for instance, but who need to be on board and who need to be supporting us to be able to keep up uh, or continue to develop the um, availability of these uh, of these values. So I think you know this is not an either or. We I would I would like to be. Um, um, I like to see both of those directions followed through. Yeah. To both end. Yeah. Uh, can I just actually propose something to you, Robert, and to Withhold, which is that there ought to be a session at one of your conferences on the theatre, on playwrights, to have a panel of playwrights, directors, maybe a government bureaucrat, the Mycenas bureaucrat, because the, we... we um, we don't have a presence much in the theatre world, for example. Um, it used to be a Tory world back in England for 40, 50 years ago, but we don't have one now. We have great, we have some conservative playwrights. I would argue Tom Stoppard is a great conservative playwright. I mean, it's cultural conservatism and moral conservatism rather than directly political. Well, that's marvelous. And um, there are other players, Simon Gray. Um, there's Richard Bean, um, who's had some successes. There's James Graham, who did the Brexit uh, film on television. Gr James Graham's not a conservative. He's on the left slightly. But he's an honest man. And, and he tells us things about po politics in his plays, which are worth knowing. And, you know, it's not very, di it's not very expensive to start a literary festival. Um, it gets expensive when it succeeds, but it's not, why don't we, there's not a single literary festival in England which has a conservative disposition or appeal. That's got to stop. We can't win these long-term battles if we neglect the influence of the arts. And the only way you can influence the arts is not, you can't just do it by criticism. It's got to be done by people actually of conservative dispositions writing plays. And since m most of the greatest plays in history have been written by people who are clearly more conservative than not, I think we have every reason to encourage that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting point to talk about the cultural landscape because this is ultimately an area that we are lacking in. Uh, it, it was interesting that actually earlier in the year, we organized an event in Oslo with our friends from Norway on the life and legacy of Roger Scruton. And rather than focusing solely on his political body of work, we also had panels on his views on art, on culture, on things like that. But you're quite right to say that we're missing in that, uh, in that world. And, and you can see it. It's, it's, it's evident for all of us. I mean, if you look at the, the Royal Shakespeare Company in London, 
when was the last time they ran a conventional version of anything? It, it, it always has to have a catch to it now. You know, there's no pure demonstration of, of, of art as it was meant to be. So perhaps you're right that there, there needs to be a movement on the artistic side of the conservative movement. But does that come from a think tank or does that come from somewhere else within the civil society? If any of you want to. I would go for a civil society. I think that's absolutely something that is fascinating as an idea and uh, that can open up a whole new world of uh, um, uh, potential access and potential you know, uh, influence. And I think it's a very important thought to, to follow up on. And um, I think it, will, it is something that, it will be, um, uh, that can be so attractive that it will create its own um, path uh, if we launch it. So absolutely... Supporting John, yeah. It's got, maybe we should also work on this uh, thing that there are many, if you say, artists or individuals who are conservative, center, center right, libertarian. They just don't know it. They have it in their gut feeling, but they cannot express it. They, they, they never had this uh, intellectual education or underpinning that we were privileged to have and to receive in order to express those ideas in a different uh, form of dispute or debate. And I think this is also a point that where think tanks can be very influential and can help gather those people and um, provide them with um, literature, with uh, exchange of thoughts and ideas and uh, debates, etc. I think this is also a tool and a task that talking about, sorry if I jumped now, but what one thing that we should also keep in mind is expanding our, um, our bucket of products, not only conferences and studies and books or magazines, uh, I already mentioned a TV show or uh, having uh, entrepreneurs involved. There's many other things that we could think of and be creative um, in creating new center-right products to get, you know, brand them in a way that, that they are attractive for people who don't know what they, that, that we exist. Of course, we, we, we could get an, we can get, we can urge millionaire, billionaires to found a television station that is not it completely under the control of the left, and particularly its drama department. We could, ho you, you, you gentlemen could actually hold a conference um, at which the people on the stage were mainly people who worked in the theater, either as impresarios or as playwrights or as actors, but who have conservative views. They're there. Uh, there's a group of them in Hollywood called the, I think it's the Friends of Abraham Lincoln or something like that. And, um, and once you actually establish points of light, so to speak, which are devoted to this, well, that will, that will in a sense, guide those people of, who are interested in the theater but have conservative views who work in it um, to, to, that, um, to, to collaborate, exchange ideas, and encourage more a a effort. I mean, I think that... Um, the uh, um, simply getting together social occasions uh, which conservative writers and, um, and actors and playwrights uh, is very useful. Because remember, a small theater company produces the playwrights which go on to write the teleplays and the seri TV serials which influence millions of people. And they can be uh, inspiring stories on our side, or there can be depressing ones on the other one. Of course, there is there's one area that we have overlooked where we are starting to win the argument, and it is partly because of think tanks, and that is in the world of architecture. We, we've seen in the last couple of years the emergence of movements that are, are, are rooted in this idea of restoring traditional architecture. I, I think of our friend uh, Eric Norin in Sweden and his uh, architectural uprising or of, uh, of Roger Adams, uh, Robert Adams and people like that with the uh, Build Streets movement in the UK. You know, the, there, there is a, a hope for clawing back on the cultural issues. But I, I'm gonna switch tact slightly, because when we talk about culture, culture is something that is, is fundamentally developed and learnt. And one of the areas that we talked about this morning was about university freedom. And one of the interesting points that was discussed was about alternative institutions. Now, there, there are some out there. You have MCC in Budapest. You have my alma mater of the University of Buckingham in the UK or the uh, Francisco Marroquin University in Guatemala. But how, how can we develop more... UDG in Montenegro. 
Yes. How can we develop more of these uh, almost, should we call them independent universities that can help boost our movement? It seems to me to be very hard to uh, develop an institution that requires serious expenditure on the part of the person applying to join it when there are free institutions which are offering essentially, I mean, the same thing um, at, a, at a zero price or even as, or as a subsidized price. Um, how do you do it? Well, I think you have to change the rules about university. I mean, I personally don't think we should automatically think that 50% of the population should go to university. And I don't actually always like the idea of forcing people at the age of 18 to make a choice of that nature when they're very out, uh, they're quite likely to make the wrong choice uh, and, or a different one to the choice they would make when they were 20, 25, 30, and so on. So I would like to change the funding of the universities to a situation in which we guarantee to people at the age, well, I'm sorry, post-19, uh, post-18, we guarantee them, uh, let us say, three years in further education, however defined, um, at any point in their life when they wish to cash the check in. Um, that would check ought to be cashable at alternative institutions as well as established state or traditional ones, and it ought to be a wider range of institutions too. I mean, um, it ought to, um, and 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 I, I think that one of the things would be that some people would go to university right away because they are classical scholars who really want to pursue classical scholarship. Others will wait and discover that they, some of them, will decide never to go, never to cash the check in. A third group will there have a conversation with their employers who will say, you know, you could use that, that investment to actually develop your skills in my company and go to, go to college and, uh, to do so. And finally, I'm, and I think maybe people in this room feel this way, I felt I didn't use the university as I should have done to its full value when I went. I'd quite like to go back in retirement, which is an ever-receding uh, situation for me. I'd quite like to go back to university now and do the subject I didn't devote myself to when I was there last time. And, and as a reward for living a long time, I think I might do that. But you can see that that means this, the, uh, the, the market for existing universities will shrink, and the market for further education as a whole is likely to expand. Well, bring in the competition principle in, in education on, on this level. And I think the question is whether it's easier to find somebody to found a new university privately, or whether it's easier to, uh, to change the education system in the respective uh, state or nation. And I think probably the second is more difficult than to, have, uh, to, to start an institution from scratch. But however, you always have, and we've seen unfortunately some examples where uh, new, univer new universities and education institutions were founded with the best of intentions to keep them in the pro-market, libertarian, conservative sense, and then all of a sudden you have people on the board um, influencing uh, the choice of professors in academia, etc., and then giving the direction uh, which we definitely would not like and that was discussed this morning. So it's, it's a difficult thing. We need to work on that for sure, but so far think tanks have taken up some of these tasks, but we cannot do the real education program that universities could have done or should do. If I may just jump in, because that reminded me of my next, uh, the point that I forgot in the beginning, which was academic freedom. Uh, and which I thought, I followed the discussion, the panel on, on the university is very interesting, um, because it really highlighted to me, you know, how, how from this sort of the inside, um, how, I don't know if discouraged we are to think about the, uh, the current loss of academic freedom that we, we see around the, the world in some of the best universities and previously best universities. And that we really have to be taking it very seriously. And probably one of the things that I would um, uh, uh, like to highlight is, is to refocus on a regaining of academic freedom and redefining it or 
um, not allowing this just to sort of go forward because the fact is that uh, academic freedom is what makes these institutions really special and that we have seen, you know, under serious pressure, uh, we have seen the negatives of it and, and there's, um, there is a way that um, uh, where we have uh, come in which we lost uh, a lot of the academic freedom, which should be the guiding or the strength of our universities. So I think a debate on academic freedom and a focus on that and supporting those uh, issues and uh, personalities, uh, organizations of students um, that reclaim this uh, is a very important responsibility. Well, as, as time is sort of slipping away from us, I think I'm going I'm to go for one penultimate question on all of this, which is that there was a good quote from Juan Soto in the last uh, panel uh, in which he said that one of the problems we have is that there is no conservative way to rebuild uh, the international world order. So that we've seen in the last few years the established order collapse, but how do we position our movement in a way that we can help to reconstruct it, perhaps in our own image, as we should have done at the end of the Cold War. Perhaps Reka, you could start with. Uh, that's a tough one because, and a very, very important one, because I think uh, in many ways the um, that international order that collapsed in 1990, um, thankfully, uh, was a uh, could have been or should have been rethought. Yes, as you say, back then. At the same time, um, because of the um, uh, multiple pressures that that were on the table uh, around us, it seemed natural. It seemed like it was happening anyways. So it didn't seem like it was an, a thing to do, uh, which is, in retrospect, clear that you know, we have to focus on that. And I think you know, we have been discussing this at this conference and from several angles, how the nation state, how the nations are at the core of our thinking, how important um, our understanding of um, the um, basic tenets of international order and uh, and international the international system are have to be respecting this and have to be founded on on this uh, basic tenet so i believe that on on that understanding it is really a time now to re focus on something that is demanded. Uh, it is challenged now by uh, several ways, and we have been discussing it, and we see it uh, uh, next door in Ukraine, how, how serious a, a pressure this can be, and how, um, how, with what force, you know, the past can come back and, and, and hit us. At the same time, we also see the, the reaction that it creates. And that kind of a cooperation, that kind of a common understanding that it provoked um, uh, in the international system, uh, in itself, I think, is a sign of, uh, for hope. John? Um, I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm one narrow area, I think, we might have a, we might be able to develop a, a set of insights, and that's international law and human rights uh, law. Now, in um, when we promulgated the 1948 Declaration, UN Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we were actually trying to universalize the standards of um, the English-speaking and Western um, European. Um, uh, values and, um, and and legal principles. Um, that that was a perfectly uh, decent thing to try to do, um, but of course it uh, it has become corrupted now. So that the American government, for example, is now embarked on trying to univer uh, trying to impose through its foreign policy the values in legal and human rights terms of the narrowest far left part of the American political spectrum. That's so that foreign policy as seen by the Biden administration is attempting to impose um, views which are simply rejected by about 80% of the world population on moral and sexual and other questions. Now, the a few years ago, um, not not that long ago, I think about 20 years ago, the um, Islamic world decided to respond to the Universal Declaration by actually seeing if it could bring forth um, its own version of this, not to replace, but to accompany 
1948 version, and it produced the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights. Now, and from an, which was specifically Islamist, uh, and it was it was the work of distinguished Islamic uh, legal scholars. Now, um, th that, for example, said uh, quite straightforwardly, it couldn't endorse the Western view of free speech. It, it, it had to insist on a cause condemning blasphemy. And it did other things like this. Now, it would not be, the final, uh, the final document that emerged would not be acceptable to all of us. But it was better than anything in the Islamic world in practice. It was an advance. And secondly, it, it, it was, there would have been some things in it which we would have agreed with. Now, law proceeds from culture and ultimately from religion. So you do have in the world, um, um, first of all, I would say, a Protestant view of uh, international law and human rights, a Catholic one. Um, you certainly have um, an Islamic one. How about Confucianism and Hinduism? I'm sure all of these would produce significantly different versions of what international law should say on these topics. And there's nothing wrong, it seems to me, without encouraging this process and about then having a grand convocation in which there was an attempt not to um, meld them all into one, but to meld them into a, a, a conversation between different world cultures, uh, which developed respect and understanding and, and an acceptance um, of, the, of how these rules could be applied in different countries and, and different regions. Um, we have to do that uh, because we cannot run the world as if um, the, 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 the views of uh, the New Statesman and the New York Times, uh, the general views of mankind, when we know they are not. And at the same time, we have to, it will be difficult for us because we've got used in the West to thinking our views rule. Well, that's probably not going to be the case. And if we don't want to have violent clashes, then we have to have some process of uh, legal discussion and understanding between different world cultures, none of which are negligible. And this is exactly why, why we need to come back to this question. What is the task of the respective institution, whether it's on the regional, on the national, or on the supranational level, and consequently check, is this still needed? Yes, no, yes, no, who do we serve? And then, after all, uh, we have all the tools in our hands, and when Thatcher said these famous words, there is work to be done, she exactly knew we have structural reforms that needed to go through. We know how this works. The only thing that we differ now is the communication tools, that these we need to adapt, but the things, how they need to be done, how can they be done, this we know, and it has been proven by her and by many others who on the conservative side who have been successfully uh, gone through those structural changes uh, that helped us elevate and grow. Well, I'm, I'm watching the clock slowly tick away. So I think we have time for one last uh, reflection. So I'm going to ask our, our panelists, what is one piece of parting wisdom that everyone here needs to take with them as we conclude this conference? And we'll start with uh, John. Uh, listen to Richard Likudko uh, uh, on any topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, I think the, um, <clears throat> the, that kind of a cooperation that we are understanding about conservative values throughout these discussions is superbly important because we are on the time, I mean, this is so timely. We are on the moment or in the moment when it has to be done. Um, I think this, it's clear that <clears throat> that kind of a piece uh, cooperation, uh, golden era that we thought uh, to start in 1990, uh, and it did did last for like three decades. It's over. That uh, that is clear. So it's not just the end of the post Cold War era. I think we will think back of these three decades as like the Jepsk. I like to say the golden era between strategic confrontations. So <laughs> we were right in the beginning of it, which means that all the fundamental values 
institutions, international legal uh, structures um, of the international system that we had before are under pressure now. And so it is the most important moment to bring forward our values, our uh, uh, understanding of the, uh, of the operations among states, because this is a time that we, we're going to reshape the world for the next, whatever, 50 years for sure. Uh, stand together, use all our intellectual force and rely on each other, not reinvent the wheel and collaborate. And listen to Dr. Lagutko. <laughs> to wiser. Well, there we go. And uh, on that, I think the, you know, we'll take that wisdom, carry it with us, and hopefully we'll see you all again next year as a stronger movement with more of us here. So thank you very much.